All right. How you doing, Brother Roy? You awake today? Drink some coffee, you wake up. Looks like this is a one pot day for you, man. All right. Uh. All right. Let's see. There we go. Now it's coming in. It's just taking a few seconds here. Brother Andrew, can you grab some water, please? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Hopefully it's not too cold for you over there. I cracked that door. It's like an oven in here. In-floor heating. Yeah, they had one of the one of the uh, rooms buckled one day. They had the the heat just cranked up to like ninety, and the floor buckled and everything. Technology. Yeah, I'm glad I wasn't in that room. All right. Well, listen, continue to pray for Brother Russ. He should be here any minute. But I pray for, for them and the work at uh, Family Bible Baptist that we're going to get started uh, this summer. Uh, and then we'll be going over a lot of this stuff here <clears throat> in a few weeks here. Uh, Brother Russ will bring a bunch of things to us. He'll have his uh, outline of what the Lord has laid on his heart to do. And looking forward to that. Please continue to pray for our evangelism ministry as well as we get out there and evangelize. And, and uh, Brother Paul, we're going to be busy this summer. And lots of places to go, and and uh, looking forward to that. We're going to get Lee out there, too. He's going to go with us up to Minneapolis and some of those other places. So looking forward to that. Yeah, he's fine up there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of... It's funny, if you look at the New Testament, the Bible talked about that, though. How Paul would go to people, he would go discreetly to some of the people of a higher, you know, because of their position and everything. It's kind of interesting. But anyway, but uh, it, it, uh, it'll it be a blessing to get up there. And brother, we're going to try to go to Minneapolis. We're going to talk about that today, right? We're going to try to go to Minneapolis maybe this next week, right? St. Paul. Is it St. Paul? Yeah. They call it Bad Friday. They call it Bad Friday? Yeah. Who calls it Bad Friday? The, uh, protesters. What are they protesting? Well, every Good Friday, the uh, Planned Parenthood up there on that Vandal Street, the way I understand it, they close down like two city streets <laughs> oh. to have a the little fair demonstration to celebrate Planned Parenthood. Well, of course, this brings out all the all the religious fanatics, of course, you know, protest them. It's quite. A, there's usually about three thousand people there, and all the really and all the volunteers that work for Planned Parenthood, according to uh, John, yeah, that they Planned Parenthood has them sign waivers that they won't speak to any of the quote protesters. That are so there's going to be preachers there preaching. Yeah. Be When's that? That's Friday. That's this next Friday. That sounds like the place to be. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of there going on there. 
I just don't want to go to jail in Hennepin County. I don't like Hennepin County jails. Is it Ramsey? Oh, okay, I'll go there then. That's fine. I, just don't, want, I don't want to go to Hennepin County jail. Amen. Well, here we go. This will be interesting. You want to go with John, or you want to try to stay separate? We'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. I'm not sure. I don't want to go. I don't want to go with anybody besides you. So. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a part of anything they're doing. I don't either, and they ain't offering. So, they ain't offered up the information. So, we gotta be careful about all that. Anyway. Um, yeah, so pray about that. We may be going there on Friday. Um, yeah, well, that'll be interesting. Hopefully, my lungs are better by then. They're they're getting better, but man, I just start these coughing spells. It just uh, <clears throat> don't go away, boy. This thing's held on. It's held on a lot. But uh, pray. So let's pray about that. About going there. Have plenty of audio with you and be ready. You know, have any better recording and everything for that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'll be good. So, yeah, we'll talk about that later, okay? We'll we'll kind of go over that and, and d talk about that a little bit. Uh, so anyway, uh, we'll keep praying for our evangelism as we do some more things, and uh, pray for uh, Sarah and her and her mom. They're up in Duluth. Uh, they were they were at a uh, homeschool expo or something up there, and uh, selling a bunch of books and all that kind of stuff. They sold all our our new old hymnals. They were the new sword of the Lord hymnals that took out repentance and all that. So they sold those and got most of those all gone there at that homeschool co-op there. So lots of people there. Big big, uh, big place. So I guess they had a good time up there, her and her mom. So pray for their safety as they travel back. I'll pray for Brother Frank, Eric Frank from Gateway and Baptist. He's driving back nine and a half hours from North Carolina. So keep him in your prayers as he drives. And... Uh, Oh, Eric Frank, good guy. But, uh, he said he was listening. He said he was listening to my sermon on Filthy Lucre, and and he goes, he goes, I'm listening to Filthy Lucre right now. And I was like, it sounds like a CCM band when you say it that way, so doesn't it? It sounds like a CCM group, Filthy Lucre. <laughs> yeah, it does kind of flow. Anyway, it was kind of funny, but but he's he's uh, on his way back, uh, on his way to Michigan. Then somebody contacted me from Michigan. This morning sent me an email and said they asked if they said they, they've been they've been listening to Dr. Scott Johnson for a long time and you know who Dr. Scott Johnson is brother Russ don't you and uh, he's got some great teachings audio teachings out there some really good stuff he goes in depth with a lot of things um, but anyway they found ours Dr. Scott Johnson mentioned us here and when I say doctor he really is a, a doctor not not a you know like a theologian doctor but a, but a real doctor uh, but anyway so he found Dr. Scott Johnson found our sermons here and was talking about them and then he started listening to our sermons and and he said he wanted to get scripturally baptized so he called he sent me an email was like hey can you baptize he's like well um, you know where you live and everything started talking about that and said well you know he's closer to Gateway he's only about he's only about an hour from Gateway at the most. And when they moved to their new building, he's only going to be about 40 minutes from there. I said, you need to go to church there. He wants a church. You know, I said, you need to go to church at Gateway. You know, um, you can get scripturally baptized there and you can go to Gateway and, and uh, you know, you need the fellowship. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he doesn't want to just get baptized. He wants a, a church. But he, he said he got saved, but he's never, he's, he never got baptized. And he just got, and he, and he started listening to our sermons. He's like, I need to get baptized. So, yeah. So, but but he's he's close to Gateway. So I said he wants to be in a local church. He goes, I want to be in one. I don't want to go to a five hundred one c three though. And I said, Well, there you go. <laughs> well, there's Gateway. So the Lord just happened to bring that uh, the cross that all all perfect there. So he's going to go there. Yeah, yeah. So it was a great email. He sent very kind. Sent a nice email and everything. And and uh, by the way, Brother Rust, as way of testimony, this is interesting. Somebody, uh, we sent out, I think it was, we sent out the Hollywood series on CD to somebody. This is funny. So you know what the, so you know what the person asked me? What do you guys know about that? Man, I'm studying something 
crazy right now. Geocentricity. <laughs> what do you guys know about geocentricity? I said, send me your address. We'll send you the series. Send, send me an email. We'll send you the series again. Isn't that something? Yeah? Yeah. What, what do you guys know about that geocentricity? Oh, I happen to have something right here. <laughs> so we're going to print, we're going to uh, uh, make your series up, get your series on CD and get it sent out to them, get, a, get the duplicates. We also this week uh, had another duplicator sent to us. Yeah, so now we have two of them. We have two seven, seven CD duplicators and uh, CD or DVD. And uh, don't worry, they'll get, they'll get used. I plan on actually, we're going to use them for our evangelism ministry. Okay, we're going to get some, we're going to get some CDs made up, and Brother Russ will will need some too, probably for what he's going to be doing over there, what we do over there. So, <coughs> excuse me, we'll be making those up, and he'll be handing those out. And uh, Brother Russ, we get that book finished here, and then we'll be able to put that on CD and give it to people too. If was that kind of your idea to either CD or or um, print form, whichever. I mean, I suppose it could do it either way, but whichever, uh, whatever your idea is on that. But uh, we can. Whatever sermon you want to put out there to hand out to people, we can get those ready too, and we can all we have all the means to duplicate them now and get them ready. So you just let me know what you want to do with that, and uh, we'll get it done. Amen. Boy, some of those. When did you do that? Because that one sermon on money, that thing just. I mean, it just skyrocketed overnight. I'm like, what in the world? Why was this one picked so much? And I was looking through the list because I get the reports of it. And it must have been because you linked to it. So Brother Russ is going to next week, next week you'll be able to talk about that, right? Next week, Brother Russ is going to preach a little bit, and he's going to explain the differences between the simple church model and a model that he ran across that people are trying to use where a man is asking for $200,000 to start a church. So... <clears throat> Brother Russ is going to share that and, and also share the differences is basically new age philosophies and all those things. So looking forward to that. He'll be bringing that to you next week, uh, probably in the afternoon service or one of them, whichever. Uh, we'll figure it out. But anyway, so lots of good stuff uh, ahead of us. Uh, again, pray for, pray for all the work that we're doing with Family Bible Baptist and, and the, 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 the work that we will be doing. And we're going to figure out another thing I want to do that Brother Russ and I need to do, some kind of intro video type, just a little short thing. We need to, and if Brother Russ wants to do it, he can. But I think I should do it with him, just so it's the pastor with the the other the man that's going to be ordained to do the work. So we're kind of together. So they see that Brother Russ just didn't come out of thin air somewhere and just decide he's going to start a church, but he actually believes the Bible. Amen. So we want to do that together, and I'm looking forward to that. So we'll figure something out for that, Brother Russ, and uh, we should get some footage of the town, though. And a few of those things. Then I'll, I'll get that on my, my handy uh, iMovie uh, app on here, and we'll, we'll turn it into a little iMovie. And, uh, huh. Yes. I was thinking that, too. I was thinking that too, so we can go to different spots and do that. Yeah, that'd be perfect. And then we'll put it all together, and I have an editing thing that can edit that, and we'll we'll produce a little video, and then we'll put it on on your page and on Family Bible Baptist page and on Old Paz Baptist Church, so we'll have it linked in both places. And then we'll put it on YouTube. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. This cough is just not going to go away right now. But the other thing we're going to do is um, we will be uh, – I'll be doing a lot of stuff like putting your sermons and, and, and the work that we're doing there. It'll be going out to everybody online. And brother, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Brother, brother Finney, I'm going to have him send it out to everybody too. <clears throat> so everybody, thank you. So everybody knows um, what's going on. You know what I mean? They, they can pray. You know, they can pray for, for everything that's, that's happening. And, and uh, obviously, Men, we're going to talk about all this stuff, and but I mean, we kind of already understand. We've we've been looking forward to this for, I mean, it's been three years, so this is not a surprise to anybody here uh, of what the Lord is going to do, and uh, you know, it's just interesting. And I don't have time to go into this, but it's it's it is interesting, Brother Paul, the evangelism ministry. All this is going to it's going to be the whole church working. It's going to be every with evangelism, with, with everything. 
see how if one piece is missing? That's why it's important to follow God. Yeah. Church family came. Amen. Amen. And then people see that. And it's like, uh, Amen. That's right. And there's families all around. That's why it's harder for the cops to hassle when there's families all over. Uh, it's harder to hassle. They must not be the boogeyman. Who are you fooling? They're still scared of you, brother. I took an open uh, seminar with open air campaigners. So I think I told you that. We went to Boston. So they taught us about that. Having a, except they're not local church, so they you got to get a ministry team. So the people will see your ministry team. <clears> around, yeah. And then that guy <clears> must <throat> be saying something interesting because other people are listening. And that'll cause other people to stop. Oh, he's saying something interesting, all right. It's the same principle. People have a herd mentality. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Herd. But they see the herd scattered. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Russ, were you going to say something? Uh, I was just, uh, if anybody wants to look at uh, FamilyBibleBaptistChurch.com, yeah, you can explain that today when you come up with lead songs or whatever, too. All that stuff if you want. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Well, listen, let's get in our Bibles here. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, somebody start that file, please, over there. Uh, the audio file there, hit record on that, and uh, we'll be ready to go here. We're going to have three messages today on this topic, and we're going to kind of cover this. There's going to be a lot more, though, because I'm going to extensively cover this as far as the, the name of it is Why Baptists Must Preach Against Rome. Why Baptists Must Preach Against Rome. And uh, you'll understand the importance uh, of it as we go along. But uh, let's pray. Father, I pray you bless us now and, and guide us in your word, guide us in this truth, help us to understand this, and help us to see that the Antichrist is rising, that spirit. The whole goal of the occult and the whole goal of the Roman Catholic Church is to prepare the way for the Antichrist. And Lord, they're doing it. And they're preparing people. And there are one billion lost souls that follow this wicked heir of Roman Catholicism. And Lord, I just pray that what we say here would, would fall on their ears somehow, that they would hear it, and that they might receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 21. I like this verse here. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Many Baptist pastors today have shirked their solemn duty to preach against Rome, against Roman Catholicism and be clear in their statements. The papacy has billions of people who are fooled by that Roman Catholicism system. They're subject to bondage. They're trapped in apostasy. They need the clear-cut voice of men of God thundering out the truth from the Scriptures. This next generation must understand and be prepared for that invasion of Rome, that ecumenical invasion that has taken place. They must be able to identify those doctrines and see how those doctrines have, have, have crept into churches today. You'd be surprised how much of Roman Catholicism and their doctrines are in Baptist churches today. You'd be shocked be absolutely shocked by it, but they are there, and they make themselves known. <clears throat> but this next generation must understand that. Now, why? Why must we preach against Rome? Why does it matter? Well, first of all, Baptists have an identity crisis today. They have an absolute identity crisis today. They really don't know who they are and why they are and what they're doing. 
Most of them have no clue why they're Baptists. They have no clue. So you know what they do? They either shun the name, they run away from it today, they go off into apostasy, they go off into the New Age movement, they go off into ecumenicalism, or their church is just simply, I talked to pastor one time and I said, hey, I want to have a Baptist history conference. He said, well, I'm just trying to get people to be fundamentalists. Really, why would you want to sell yourself short? Why would you want to absolutely sell yourself short by just stopping at fundamentalism or the fundamentals of the faith? Because the Baptist distinctives go much further than that. And you're going to see how it affects everything. It affects your view of government. It affects your view of, of, of church discipline, of, of church doctrine, of baptism, of everything. And you find out, hey, do we identify with Rome or do we identify... Listen, there's only two camps. And whether you like this or not, this may make people mad. There's Baptists and there's Rome and her daughters. Yeah, or somewhere in between. But, uh, but uh, yeah, exactly. But there's, on, there's only really two camps. Now, I'm not saying that their Protestants aren't saved. I'm not saying that at all. I, I know many Protestants are saved, okay? I understand that. I'm not, I'm not saying they're... I'm saying the group classifications understand it matters where you come from. It matters what you believe about where you come from. It matters a whole lot. Reason number one, we must preach against Rome because we were never part of Rome. That's the first reason, because Baptists were never part of Rome. But today you have an onslaught of teaching in churches today that try to make it, well, see, there was this one holy Roman Catholic church. And, and, and everybody else had, and there was a Protestant Reformation that took place. And then everybody left that Roman Catholic Church. Um, no, that's not true. That's not what happened. Okay? That's not what happened at all. And if you believe that, you've believed a lie. You've, been, you've fell for one of the oldest tricks. But what you're trying to tell me is, is that something clean came from the unclean. No, it would needs be that something apostatized from the clean. That's how it would work. There was a pure line of churches, and then someone built something and apostatized from it, from the truth. And that would be Roman Catholicism that apostatized from the truth. They left the truth. They went out from us because they were not of us. Amen? That's the truth. Roman Catholicism is nothing more than Babylonian worship. Christ promised that he would receive glory in his church, that he should receive glory in his church, and he promised that there would always be a church. He, if, he was, if he's to receive glory in the church throughout all ages, how could he if there never was a church, if there was a time that there never was a Bible church? Makes no sense. You say, so how can you prove that? I believe it by faith, first of all. I believe what, it's like geocentricity. Can you explain the science? No, I can't explain the science at all. I don't get hard, I don't get half of it. But when I see in the Bible what it says, I just believe what the Bible says. And if you want to call me a dummy because I believe the Bible, I say, okay, fine, I'm a dummy. Okay, I just believe the Bible. I believe what it says. So when Jesus said there's a church and there's always been his church and it's always been here, then I believe him because he promised it. So I believe him. Oh, am I supposed to believe a human record over God? Am I supposed to believe a tainted history of Roman Catholicism? Am I supposed to believe in a Protestant Reformation? Why? Why would I? I believe the Bible. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the little stone Peter wasn't the rock. Jesus Christ is the rock. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Poor Peter has been exalted to places he never should have been. And never wanted, by the way. And, and said who the foundation stone was, right? He said who the foundation was. He said who the rock is. He said it's Jesus Christ. Amen? And he said, I will always put you in remembrance of these things. And it's all about Jesus. It's all about Christ. Throughout all ages, it's all about Christ. Baptists never came from Rome. They were called Novationists. They were called Waldenses. They were called Lollards. They were called Petrobrusians. They were called Anabaptists, Baptists, Paulicians. They never bowed the knee to Rome, and they existed long before Rome ever did. 
Rome apostatized from the biblical truth. If this be not true, then the Bible is not true, for Christ foretold that He would build His church. Now, do you believe Christ, or do you believe a history book? Do I believe man, man's record? Only when it lines up with God's. If it, if it does not line up with, with God's record, then I, then I junk the record and I move on and I follow the truth. Amen. How about martyrs' mirrors for a man's record? The history of baptized martyrs. Our enemies kept great records of the Baptist people they destroyed. In fact, I remember the author of Martyr's Mirrors, I was just reading it yesterday, did a lot of studying there yesterday, and he said something, he said, you know, I feel ashamed, but I must use the records of Rome. I don't want to use their records, but I have to. Because they kept a good record of who they killed and why they killed them. You know, I, next hour, I'm going to bring to you, it's going to be a message on the martyrs, basically. And that might not matter to you if you see yourself in this great disconnect that you're out here and that there is no history there and it's just you out here trying to do something. Or if you understand that there's always existed people that stood up for God and died for Him. Yeah. You know, they weren't hot shots. They weren't big stars. Nobody clapped for them when they walked in a room. If you're going to serve Christ, you might just lose your head. Sobering thought. It ought to be. But you know what? Even if I couldn't find you one thread of info outside of the Bible, I believe Christ. But how about Sir Isaac Newton? Baptists maintain that they existed before the Catholic apostasy took place that they existed alongside Catholicism after her formation, and that they existed apart from Catholicism. Pretty good witness. How about the, uh, the royal historians of the King of Holland? We have now seen that the Baptists, who were formerly called Anabaptists in the later times, Mennonites were the original Waldenses. On this account, the Baptists may be considered as the only religious community which has stood since the days of the apostles and as a Christian society which has preserved pure the doctrines of the gospel through all ages. By the way, this historian was hired by the king because he said, who are these people in my kingdom? I mean, they're good citizens. They don't hurt anybody, but who are they? I'd like to know who they are. So he studied it out. He found out who they were. <coughs> Excuse me. I like this quote from Charles Spurgeon, too, one of the best I've seen on this subject. We believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. We do not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther or Calvin were born. <laughs> we never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it. But we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We have always existed from the very days of Christ, and our principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherence. Persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect, yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others, nor, I believe, any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the consciences of men under the control of man. We have ever been ready to suffer, as our martyrologies will prove, but we are not ready to accept any help from the state to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with the government. Wow. Sounds like he wasn't 501c3. And we will never make the church the despot over the consciences of men. Hmm. Good, isn't it? John Gill said this, I should think the valleys of Piedmont, which lie between France and Italy, are intended where God has preserved and continued a set of witnesses to the truth in a succession from the beginning of the apostasy to the present time. Mm. You want to talk about a trail of blood? Just go through Piedmont, you'll find it. We were never a part of Rome and never tried to reform the Roman church. And our spiritual ancestors fought her and died. And Baptists must preach against Rome. They must understand where they came from. They must realize you never came out of that. You were never part of it. 
These Baptist, baptized believers, they could be found hiding from Constantine and his flaming sword when he started the great apostasy, or they could be seen hiding from men like Origen and Augustine who murdered them and set, set up their own Catholic puppet priest in churches when pastors would not give in, would not bow down and swear allegiance to Rome. Oh, surely not Augustine. Or Augustine. <laughs> God help us. We have a generation that needs to hear this truth thundered loud and preach against Rome and stand for the truth and understand where you came from. Oh, why does it even matter? Why does it matter? Because, because fundamentalist churches today have more Roman Catholic doctrine in them than ever. And I've heard pastors tell me, well, you, you, just, you, can't offend, you don't want to say too much because you offend Roman Catholics. Okay. And explain why that's a bad thing. A lot of people that get offended, they get right. I'd rather you be offended than die and go to hell. I'd rather you be offended with the truth. And we don't want to offend them. Don't preach against Buddha. That's like saying don't preach against Buddha. Do you realize that Roman Catholicism is the greatest mother of all harlots, mother of all cults ever? I mean, do you realize that it is, it is the most deceptive one out there? It has the most power, the most money, the most influence, and the most dangerous. And preparing the world for the Antichrist. The Baptist name is not always how you trace us, but it is through our scriptural principles and ordinances you will find us through history. Not every church had perfect doctrine in every area. But now we have the benefit in the last 400 years to have the perfect, inspired, complete words of God in the King James Bible. Amen. Who, by the way, some of those manuscripts can be credited to those Waldenses and those others that gave their life. They were part of that. Amen. Some never had the entire scriptures like that. Some have never had the entire Bible like that. They did, what we know as the Bible, they didn't have. Did you see the miracle that God did with that King James Bible? It's when you start to understand the miracle of it. So when you, when you look at people down through the ages, you say, well, they had this wrong, they had that wrong. Yeah, they didn't have what you have. You have everything. You have the whole, you have the completed, you have all of it. For some reason, people have in their mind that since like Timothy and, and, and John the Revelator, that everybody just walked around with one of these. They just walked around with one of these. They had the whole thing. They just walked around with it. No, they did not. They had portions of this, but they didn't have this. And they didn't have this. Like, you have this. No, they didn't. <coughs> Excuse me. No, they didn't. <clears throat> right. Exactly. The Roman Catholic Church, we'll, we'll talk about that sometime too. Um, there's so many reasons why we need to preach against Rome that this, this is just starting. There's going to be a lot more, but uh, coming. All right. Next, reason number two. Baptists need to preach against Rome because we do not believe in dominion theology. We have never aspired to dominion theology. Amen? Rome and all her daughters have the dreaded theology of dominion theology. What does that mean? It means that, that the, re, the, the church and the state are tied together and rule basically the earth by force, by the sword. Rome denies the separation of church and state, and so do many of her daughters of the Protestant Reformation. Many of them deny the separation of church. No, it's just the state's not supposed to control the church, but the church can control the state. No. No. First of all, you have to believe in the church. <clears throat> ben, and I don't believe in the church. <laughs> like that. <clears throat> That'll make some people happy. Dominion theology, also called Kingdom Now theology, is a false teaching stating that man is commissioned to bring the entire world under the dominion of Christianity. 
by force if necessary, and then hand over a Christianized world to Jesus when he comes. Because, you know, we're going to hand over Christ because Jesus needs our help with that. You know, he needs our help to rule with a rod of iron when he comes. So, you know, you, we're going to prepare it for him. No, that's not even biblical. That's not even biblical. They believe this in his death and resurrection. Jesus reversed the curse that took place from Adam's fall and took back dominion, giving to believers the responsibility to restore all that was lost, defeat every enemy, and bring the entire world into the restored kingdom. See? Mm. By the way, we see traces of this in Calvin and Zwingli and Luther. All the Protestant children. What did they do? Took the arm of the state and the sword of the state and sent it out against people that believe different than they did. And every government, every government since Christ left did the same thing. Every government besides one that held Baptist principles. Why? Because Baptist principles are different than Roman Catholicism and Dominion theology and the daughters of Rome. They are different. Their principles have been different. Why? They're biblical. They all, they all brutally persecuted the Anabaptists, Calvin, Zwingli, and Luther, and Waldenses, and the heads of state. They used the sword of the government, of the beast, to persecute. <clears throat> they used the, the government, the beast, to persecute. Now, where did they learn such tactics, the daughters of Rome? Where could they have learned such a tactic from? They got it from Rome. Hey, I got one for you. Where do you think Muhammad got his tactics from? Rome. Oh, you didn't know that Islam is a product of Roman Catholicism? Absolutely. At, yes. That too is pedophilia and everything. Yeah, that come from Rome. Amen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rome, biggest bunch of perverts ever. I'm talking about the papacy now, not, not Roman Catholic people. They don't, they don't understand. They don't know what goes on. They don't even know. They're in darkness. They're like a lot of fundamentalists that never knew that their leaders were doing a lot of crooked stuff because they were told not to talk about it. Don't ask questions. Don't question authority. Be quiet. That's the doctrine of Rome, by the way. Don't ask questions. Just do what you're told. <clears throat> From Rome, who completely denies the reign of Christ for a thousand years. They don't believe in the thousand year reign of Christ. They believe, the, that, they believe that's figurative and, and Christ is reigning through the Pope. That he is the vicar of Christ and that, the, that, that he rules the world and Christ rules and reigns through him. That's what they believe. That's why they don't believe. That's why they're all millennialists. They do not believe in the return of Christ like that. They don't believe they, they, that he rules and reigns through him. Listen to this. In the coronation of all popes, including Pope Pius XII, on March 12, 1939, he said this, The tiara is placed on the candidate's head with the words, Receive the tiara ordained with three crowns, and know that thou art father of princes and kings, ruler of the world, vicar of our Savior Jesus Christ. See why Baptists have to preach against Rome? He says this, the hand of God who guides the course of history has set down the chair of his vicar on earth in this city of Rome, which from the be being the capital of the wonderful Roman Empire was made by him the capital of the whole world because he made it the seat of a sovereignty which, since it extends beyond the confines of nations and states, embraces within itself all the peoples of the whole world. The very origin and divine nature of his sovereignty demands the inviolable rights of the conscience of millions of the faithful of the whole world demand that this sacred sovereignty must not be, neither must it ever be, appear to be, subject to any human authority or law. You see that? Whatsoever, even though that law be one which proclaims certain guarantees for the liberty of the Roman pontiff. End quote. Pope Pius XI, what is he saying here? He's saying that he rules over all the governors of the world. He rules over all the leaders of the world. And if you don't believe it, I'll send you a video of, him sta uh, of these bishops standing, and these Roman pontiffs standing with your Supreme Court justices, 
the presidents of the United States and all the, the government officials, all the major government officials of this country right here in ceremonies where they hand over their sovereignty to that Pope. It's all on video. It's right there. But America's too busy watching American Idol. Yeah. They've already handed over all that. That's why Rome is the great whore. Already runs it all. Oh, come on. How could they have that much power? He who has the gold makes the rules. You don't know anybody richer than the Pope. And I don't mean that guy that walks around calling himself the Pope either. That's, he's just a figurehead. <laughs> he's not the Jesuit. Of course, he is a Jesuit, though, this one is. Sure, he just loves us. Pope Innocent III claims authority over kings, just as the founder of the universe established two great lights in the firmament of heaven, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. So, so too, he's, he's set two great dignities in the firmament of the universal church. The universal church. The greater one to rule the day, that is souls, and the lesser to rule the night, that is bodies. These dignities are the papal authority and the royal power. Now, just as the moon derives its light from the sun and is indeed lower than in quantity and quality in possession, position and in power, so too the royal power derives the splendor of its dignity from the pontifical authority. Letter to Acrobus of the and the nobles of Tuscany, 1198. Yeah, they really believe this. Yeah. You can do that when you when when you worship Lucifer and you have and you have uh, satanic power. Mm -hmm. Listen to this. Tell us we are Catholics first and Americans are Englishmen afterwards. Of course we are. Tell us in the conflict between the church and the civil government, we take the side of the church. Of course we do. Why, if the government of the United States were at war with the church, we would say tomorrow, to hell with the government of the United States. And if the church and all the government of the world were at war, we would say to hell with all the governments of the world. Why is it that in this country where we have only 7% of the population, the Catholic Church is so much feared? She is loved by all her children and feared by everybody. Why is it the Pope has so much tremendous power? Why, the Pope is the ruler of the world. All the emperors, are the, all the kings, all the princes, and all the presidents of the world are as these altar boys of mine. The Pope is the ruler of the world. Source, the Western Watchman, paper published in St. Louis by Father Felon, June 27, 1912. Yeah, they believe it. You say, I, yeah, but do you? Well, I'll tell you this that President Obama came out and said that, well, listen, just to make everything clear, the Pope is not going to be tried for anything. For all these child trafficking and, and abuse, he made a public statement out of nowhere. The Pope will not be tried. He has immunity. You think somebody believes that? Dominionists teach the kingdom of God as, as a literal and physical kingdom to be advanced on earth in the present age. Some liken the New Testament kingdom of the Old Testament Israel in ways that justify taking up the sword to war against enemies of their kingdom. They teach that men can and must be coerced or compelled to enter the kingdom. I mean, Zwingli believed it. He drowned the Anabaptists and used the power of the state to persecute. He said, you want to be baptized? Okay. He drowned them all. If you want to learn more about that, see the Sermon Baptist, A Prophecy of Persecution. Baptists never held to that form of government but stood against that. Roger Williams and John Clark formed the first government in history that did not persecute non-believers or those that believed different than they did. They formed it in Rhode Island. By religious freedom or soul liberty is meant the natural and inalienable right to every soul to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience and to be unmolested in the exercise of that right so long at least as he does not infringe upon the rights of others. That religion is and must be a voluntary service and that only such service is acceptable to God. And hence that no earthly power, whether civil or ecclesiastical, has any right to compel conformity to any creed or to any species of worship or to tax a man for its support. 
By the way, I got this from, from uh, Brother Gerald Finney's website. This principle gives to Caesar the, first, the things that are Caesar's, but it denies the, to Caesar the things that are God's. It does not make it a matter of indifference what a man believes or how he acts, but it places all of the same footing before God, the only Lord of the conscience, and makes us responsible to him alone for our faith and practice. By 1900, this doctrine was very generally accepted, not only in Virginia, but also throughout the United States. It had been incorporated into our national and state constitutions, and it was the basis of all civil liberties. Soul liberty is opposite of dominion theology. Soul liberty is scriptural. Dominion theology stands in opposition to soul liberty. It says no. An enforced uniformity of religion throughout a nation or civil state confounds the civil and religious, denies the principles of Christianity and civility, and that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That was Roger Williams, A Bloody Tenet of Persecution. By the way, I have that book. It's a good book. He wrote that in 1773. <clears throat> oh, no, excuse me, no, that wasn't. Uh, John Leland wrote this next quote in 1773. Religious matters are to be separated from the jurisdiction of the state, not because they are beneath the interests of the state, but quite to the contrary, because they are too high and holy and thus are beyond the competence of the state. That was Isaac Backus, by the way. Yeah. He's right. You let the state get a hold of anything, they mess it all up. All of it. Here's another one. God has appointed two kinds of government in the world, which are distinct in their nature and ought never to be confounded together, one of which is called civil, the other ecclesiastical government. Isaac Backus, Colonial Baptist from New England, an appeal to the public for religious liberty. That's the total opposite of what Rome believes. And we need to preach against We need to preach against Rome so we understand the differences and the distinctions. Rome believes that by force people must follow her and not let them die. And if they don't, then they must die by the sword. You cannot believe this, that God would force any man to believe against his will or follow him and use the sword to enforce that. God's never done that. It's a Catholic doctrine, not Baptist. However, most Baptists hold to this. They follow David Barton and a few others that believe in this, where the state must control, or the church must control and be linked with the state. They don't believe there's any separation between the two. Well, if there was no separation, then please tell me why your forefathers were beaten and died and fought for a separation between the two. Because they knew that whatever ruling class was in at the time, whatever rulers were in at the time, whatever their religious flavor was, they would persecute the other. But if there was liberty for all, then all could make their own decisions about what they believe. And all must answer before God. These establishments metamorphosize the church into a creature and religion into a principle of the state, which has a natural tendency to make men conclude that the Bible is Bible religion is nothing but a trick of the state. John Leland, right of conscience, inalienable, and therefore religious opinions not cognizable by the law. The writings of late Elder John Leland. The liberty I this is what John Leland said. The liberty I contend for is more than toleration. The very idea of toleration is despicable. It supposes that some have preeminence above the rest to grant indulgence, whereas all should be equally free, Jews, Turks, that's Muslims, pagans, and Christians. Test oaths and established creeds should be avoided as the worst of evils. The writings of Elder John Leland. Our forefathers knew that a man given the chance to hear the gospel must have the same chance to reject it. Evangelize him, yes, but persecute him and try to force him to follow the Pope in Rome or any other Pope, whether it's a Baptist one, and there's some of those, or whether it's a, a uh, Protestant one, and there's many of those, or whether it's a Catholic one. Baptists held to not, not toleration, but to liberty. And you must answer to God for what you believe. We must not apologize for what we believe, but make it very clear what we believe. We must preach against the doctrines of Rome because dominion theology is dangerous because of the fact that we never came from Rome. And you need to understand where you came from, why you're a Baptist, why you hold to these things, why you believe them. You must understand those things. Your children, the next generation, these coming up, they must understand that they were never part of Rome. They don't trace their history. Their, their, their history doesn't come through Rome. There was always a church that existed outside, alongside of Rome, 
before Rome was ever there that held to apostolic beliefs. You're going to find out the next hour when we talk about the martyrs. The whole message is on the martyrs. A lot of reading, so you're going to have to bear with me. It's a lot of reading, but I want to give you a history of the martyrs from the time of Christ until now. So you understand that there were people that held these principles, and we know that because they died for these principles. And they never accepted or bowed the knee to Rome. Baptists, Baptists need to preach against Rome. You need to understand why. Because everybody else is holding Rome's hand right now, that's why. Everybody else is shaking hands with them. Oh, I, I'm going to talk about this later, but I heard one guy say, well, they're not so, Rome's not, I mean, that Pope John Paul, he was a pretty good guy. <coughs> um, good guys don't lead people to hell. Good guys don't tell men not to get married. Yeah, good guys don't say that they're the vicar of Christ, that they're God on this earth. Amen. Amen? Good guys don't blaspheme God's name. Good guys don't worship women. That's right, he is a devil. They're antichrist. I'm going to show you how your forefathers, since the days of the apostles, or since the formation of the Roman Catholic Church, always believed that guy was antichrist. That establishment is antichrist. And they pulled no punches. I could, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have a little bit on the trial, uh, one trial that took place. And they asked this man questions. I'm telling you, the boldness of these guys when they're about ready to die is just unreal. I mean, the power of God. These people are ready to die, and they're looking him right in his face, and what they're saying to this guy is just unreal to me. Just the power of God that they had, and the boldness that they had as they were going to the stake to be burned. They didn't back down at all, and they just said, "Okay, I'm ready to go." But I'm not bowing the knee to you. Reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know? I'm not careful to answer thee, O king. God is able to deliver us out of your hand. And if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down to you. Baptists must preach against Rome. Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, thank you so much for a history, a rich heritage. Thank you for the promise that you, had, that you would always have a church that the gates of hell would not prevail against it, that there would always be churches, there would always be believers, there would always be those that believed your doctrines of the Scriptures and followed them and not a man. Help us to be those people in these end times, Lord. Bless, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll start in